this evening to our Thursday Bible studies at the Truth Missionary Baptist Church Dansuman Exhibition Accra. We do trust that good Lord himself will bless us as we study his word together. So now friends, let us pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful to thee for grace given to us. We thank thee for thy love to us. We thank thee for thy delight in us and how thou didst plan our salvation from eternity past until the day when thou didst in practical literal terms took us to thyself in Christ. We bless thy holy name, O Lord our God, for all of these blessings. And we come to thee remembering, O Lord, our great indebtedness to thee and to thy love. For which cause, O Lord, we have gathered this evening. We ask, Lord, be merciful to us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And Lord, come and teach us thy word. Cause our hearts to be warmed. And cause our desires to overflow. Oh, that we may know more of thy love. And know more of thy goodness. And know more of thy will. So come and bless us. And be with us. For we ask all of these things. In the name of Jesus Christ our Savior, and for his sake, Amen. We shall sing together the hymn number 440, hymn 440, in the Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship, 440, how vast the treasure we possess, how rich thy bounty, King of grace, this world is ours, and worlds to come, earth is our Lord and heaven our home.
chapter 5, we shall begin to read from verse 1. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, we begin to read from verse 1. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For this is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. Neither do men light a candle, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The Lord add his blessing upon the reading, the hearing and the keeping of his holy word and to grant us all the understanding. Brethren, let us come before the Lord again in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come again into thy holy and glorious presence, acknowledging thy goodness, thy greatness, even over us in all the world. O oh Lord, we come to thee that thou mightst have mercy upon us for all the sins we have committed against thee as individuals, sins that we have done in thought and sins that we have done in practice sins we have committed deliberately and the sins we have committed presumptuously and ignorantly sins O oh Lord we have done with high handedness and careless abandon and sins O oh Lord we have committed even with all kinds of evil motives forgive us O oh Lord our God and cleanse our hearts and remember us O oh Lord for the sake of Christ, remember us and be with us. We gather before thee as a church, knowing how weak we are in many ways and how we have fallen in many ways. For when we look into thy word and look at thy standards, thy principles, and how far we have fallen, we loathe and indeed mourn in sin and repent, O Lord, and come confessing we come confessing our lack of uh, careful diligence in the things of Christ. We come confessing our carelessness. We come confessing even our toying with the world and toying with temptation and toying with things that are indeed of great import. We come, O oh Lord, asking for grace and pardon for every sin we have done and have committed against thee. And we pray that Lord thou would forgive us as individuals and as a corporate body. And dear Lord, we pray that thou will be with us also to grant unto us such wisdom, such courage, such strength, that we may in many ways be able to say no to sin 
and yes to righteousness. And we pray that, Lord, I will yet draw our hearts away from the cares of this life, from the deceitfulness of riches. Oh, draw our hearts away from ourselves, for seeking our own way, and seeking to do our own will, and seeking our own pleasures, and our own delights, and not that of Christ. Remember us, O Lord, we pray, and have mercy for thine own name's sake. We pray for the sick amongst us, that thou will heal them all. We pray for those who are troubled, that thou will grant them grace. We pray for those who are going through all manner of difficult times. Lord, be thou near them, especially thy servants. We pray for those who have even lost their jobs in this time of COVID-19. Lord, provide for them. And we do remember thy servants all across the world, the churches, the people that have been persecuted because of Christ. Oh, Lord, be thou with them. Those churches all across the world that need so much. Some need logistics. Some need decent church buildings. Some need funding for all their activities. Some need support and help. Some need such grace to be able to reach out to many. Oh, Lord, we pray, be thou with them. And some need courage and strength and the power and boldness to be able to stand up to the Nebuchadnezzars of our day, to be able to stand up against even the Goliaths of our day. Oh, Lord, those intimidating forces, especially in California, against the Grace Community Church and many other places, Lord, cause thy servants to stand up and be counted, that thy people will stand up and stand up for Jesus. And we pray that, Lord, I will yet grant strength also unto our brother Joseph Soko in Zimbabwe. O oh Lord, raise him up, we pray. Let thy will be done and strengthen him, that the work of the gospel may go on over there in Zimbabwe. And all across Africa, many of thy choicest servants and all their challenges thou knowest, and many of the churches and all the difficulties, we bring them all before thee. Lord, have mercy and bless and be thou with us, O Lord, tonight, as we come to thy holy word. Thy word is truth. Thy word is power. Thy word brings joy and comfort. Thy word brings power and unction. So come, O Lord, we pray, that thy Holy Spirit will work in our hearts, that as we look into thy word and study it, that our understanding will be made clearer, that we may see and know that which is thy will, that we may be strengthened even in the inner man to be able to stand up and go out there and prove to the world that truly we are thine disciples. So come, O Lord our God, and bless us and be thou with us. For we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior and for his sake. Amen. Turning now to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and to verse 13 and 14. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. And my dear friends, in our Bible study tonight, we will speak to the title or the heading, The Christian in the World, Part 1. The Christian in the World, Part 1. And these uh, verses that we just read are part of the opening address of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sermon on the mount. It was delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ very, very early at the beginning of his ministry. It is to set forth for us what some theologians call the kingdom rules or the kingdom standards. The kingdom of God and its rules and its principles and its standards. And so the Lord Jesus Christ beautifully 
and wisely began with what is known as the blessed or the beatitude. And so if you take these uh, first 16 verses of uh, Matthew's Gospel chapter 5, especially from verse 3 to 16, it can be divided into three parts. Uh, verses uh, 3 to 6 describes how we became Christians. How we became Christians. Remember Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So poverty or a realization of one's bankruptcy in spiritual things and a mourning over them and a meekness to seek the Lord and a hungering after righteousness. They lead us to become the Lord's people, to become Christians. Then we have the second part, verses 7 to 12, how we live as Christians. Not just how we become Christians, but how we live as Christians. And so right from verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the believer already, or made one, becomes one who shows mercy, and is pure in heart, and is a peacemaker, and is one often persecuted. And verses 11 and 12 actually shows us our attitude in persecution. But when we come to verses 13 through 16, which is the third part, we see how we as Christians influence the world. And that is captured under these two great metaphors that the Lord Jesus Christ used. I read you verse 13 and 14 again. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Jesus Christ used two great metaphors, salt and light. And it is so because uh, they describe our main mission and purpose in the world as Christians. And so much is contained in these verses that we may just have to deal with the, uh, part one of the study even this evening. And of course, whilst we look at it, don't you see how the Lord Jesus Christ, the great prophet, the great rabbi, the great teacher, the wise rabbi, knows how to teach and the Lord Jesus Christ just used two things that are so common in the world salt and light things that are so common in everyday life and the Lord Jesus Christ used that even to capture the mission of believers in the world now these two things the salt and the light are so so that they can never be forgotten when we remember we see salt every day you go to the kitchen you see salt you go to the grocery shop you see salt light is around you every day soon the sun sets and you must have light so these things are so common and they are so uh, used by the Lord that they can be easily remembered easily remembered and in stating the mission of the disciples, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is pointing out that the disciples or the people he's addressing have already become believers. And so we will just um, uh, look at our very first main herding, the people described in the metaphor, all right? The people described in the metaphor. And when you look at verse 13 and verse 14, it's very significant. Note that you see the word ye. Ye. Verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. 
Now, obviously, he meant those who have been beautified. In other words, those beatitudes that we're talking about, those people who have been adorned by those beatitudes, who have become part, it has become part of their lifestyle. They are the ones that the Lord Jesus Christ is describing here. In fact, we can say rather primarily the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to his disciples. Verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, He was addressing the disciples, but of course he was addressing the crowd, so primarily, he was speaking to his people. Now note that the ye comes before the metaphor. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. Well, Jesus our Lord could have said, Well, the salt of the earth is ye. Or you. Or you are like, he could use the word a simile, you are like a salt in the earth or like you know the light of the world but he brought the word ye for the sake of emphasis he placed it forward ye and it's a direct comparison ye are the salt all right the direct metaphor it's a direct comparison not a <coughs> not a simile you are directly you are light and you are salt and so, my dear friends, it's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, to the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is not the only place in the world where we have such references made of um, uh, the disciples of the Lord or people who are believers. If you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, almost a similar passage, but Jesus was speaking about discipleship. In Luke chapter 14, and we read verse 34. Uh, Jesus said the same thing. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So he was directly referring to his disciples. If you turn with me also to Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, we read these words that the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that he may know how he ought to answer every man. Seasoned with salt. Now, it does not simply mean that uh, believers uh, have to have their speech just seasoned with salt, but because they are the salt of the earth, their speech should be always of what? Of grace. They are what they are and what comes out of them is as a result of what they are. You see, as a man thinketh, so is he. What is in you is what bubbles out. And so in the scriptures, we have such uh, uh, passages referring to. Then, of course, uh, if you turn with me to Ephesians, for instance, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writing, likens believers to light. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. So he was speaking to believers. He said, ye are now light in the Lord. So work as children's children of light. Then you come to verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. If you come to Philippians chapter 2, and uh, verse 15, Philippians chapter 2, one of those most beautiful uh, passages of scripture. Philippians 2, and we read verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as light in the world. So believers shine as light in the world. They are the salt and the light. 
if you turn with me again to first thessalonians chapter 5 and i read you just verse 5 first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 5 ye are all the children of light and the children of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness so believers are regarded as salt and light and when jesus spoke the sermon on the mount addressing his true believers as salt and light he's obviously making the point that later the apostle paul and in the teachings of the other apostles and the rest of scripture have always made that point concerning believers they are salt and they are light in the world now that means a number of things number one it means they manifest themselves as true disciples of the Lord by being salt and light you notice Jesus said I mean if a salt has lost its usefulness then of course it cannot be used it is thrown away so you see until as a believer you prove yourself to be a true salt and light will come into that metaphor later until you prove yourself to be a true salt and light in the world you cannot be a disciple of Christ nor we may say you cannot be an effective Christian in the world that is there secondly with the people described it means they are a people who are endued with all grace you cannot be light if you do not have light and you cannot be salt if you are not made salt you see the point so it meant therefore that every believer has been endued with such graces from the holy spirit to enable him be the salt of the earth and the light of the world you see it thirdly what it means is this believers are never to live for themselves when jesus said ye are the salt of the earth ye are the light of the world he meant therefore that they are to be acting influencing living a life so described as salt or light and by that they are never ever to live for themselves and may I quickly put, uh, mention one great hindrance to such. You know, we lose our testimony. We lose our light. We lose our usefulness and profitableness. When we focus on ourselves. And we focus on what we want to do. What we desire to do. What we love to do. We, we put ourselves into such a state that we forget and neglect God's will and in so doing we realize that we've lost it and we've lost our usefulness and so you see we are saved to serve we are told in Acts chapter 13 that David served his own generation so are our believers we are saved to serve now I was in discussion with uh, another pastor a, a couple of days ago and uh, while we're talking about what is happening in the world the COVID-19 and all of that and then he made quite a, a very strong statement he said do you know pastor Ferguson that with all that is happening in the world today it is the Lord's purpose that you and I are called to minister and he struck me I said yes of course why not with all these things about COVID-19, with all the fears, with all the black lives matter, with all these uh, uh, tumults in the world, this is the time when believers are called to be salt and light, to serve our own generation. And so, my dear friends, that is very clear. Then finally, of course, that means that we are God's representatives or Christ's representatives which means therefore 
that we are to act the way he wants us to act. And when we draw all the lessons we can draw later from being a salt and being a light, I'm sure that will be very clear. But finally, finally, there is also this, which is a comforting thought. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. Oh, my dear friends, you know what Jesus is saying? It is simply echoing what he will say later on in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. You know what Jesus says? He is building his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church will still be in the world. And no matter what it is, the church, the believers, the Christians will be the salt and will be the light. There will always be a remnant. There will always be those who will be God's own people who will be salt and who will be light. And that, my dear friends, is comforting, isn't it? It comforts us to know that we, are, uh, we serve a God who knows all things. And so, even in our day and age, we have come to understand that we are the uh, salt of the earth and the light of the world. But my second main heading is this. And this is exploring the nature of the metaphor. Again, we'll come to the metaphor next week and look at them as individual metaphors. But here we want to explore the nature of the metaphors. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. Well, what does that mean? It means, number one, believers or Christians have an unlimited sphere to work. What it means is this. We are not called, or the disciples were not called, simply to take the gospel only to Israel or to a few people in the world, but to all the world. Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. So the earth, the world, is the place where we operate. And no wonder in the great commission Jesus said go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature to all the world so you see believers everywhere in the world must be salt and they must be light and the ministry is not just in a small corner the ministry is to all the world so we, we are looking at how Jesus put the words together so we could understand. Secondly, as we look at the nature of this uh, metaphor, we see that salt and light work quietly but effectively. Please note this point. When you pour salt on meat, you don't see any real chemical reaction going on. Except perhaps when you have other chemicals around and you pour salt in it, you might find some kind of chemical reaction. But when you season food or meat or anything with salt, you don't see what goes on, but work goes on. The meat is seasoned. And of course, the food is made what? Palatable. The same thing with light. When light shines, it makes no noise. I mean, light is shining. Light is thrown. No noise. But light is effective. It is thrown. People can see. You see the reason why believers don't need to be looking for a more showy or exhibitionist type of ministry. You can be effective quietly wherever you go without necessarily making any noise or show. There are some people in Christendom today, unfortunately, who think that to be heard, you must make a lot of noise. 
who think to worship man's may, must make a lot of noise who think to be effective in trying to win neighbors I must go around and uh, with a megaphone and shouting at them and no my dear friends many years ago when I was studying about something about personal evangelism there was a man who was a Muslim had a Muslim background who uh, had become a Christian and he was telling us how to they used to go around um, uh, northern parts of Africa smuggling Bibles and trying to speak to people and sometimes he tells me you know he they, are, he, they found out that they could uh, reach out a lot more people petrol attendants for instance as they are filling their tank and talk to them a little bit about Christ and share the gospel in a, a second or a minute with them and give them a track quietly and all without making any noise and he was saying by that many people quietly and secretly turned to the Lord and they came to believe and he gave this famous illustration about how the kind of um, uh, evangelism that people do today where they would like to gather crowds in a stadium and then uh, put up big big uh, signboards and adverts and all of that and say we are having this and that and that and he said the most effective evangelism is this if you go around and you gather so many people and you have one bucket of water and you throw it into the air all these bottles that are gathered you know representing people will take in just a little drop from the water but if you take one bottle and you sit down you can feel the bottle set it aside take another bottle fill it and that is effective and of course learning from him at that time in those early 90s came, came to my understanding that the most effective evangelism is the quiet type the talking it over with people the speaking to them so quietly in their homes going to them not disrupting everything they are doing not trying to be arrogant and impudent I'm a child of the king I have come to tell you about the way of salvation if you don't believe you'll die no but that most powerful quiet effective way of dealing with souls that is what salt is salt works effectively quietly on food so is light and so it is we must learn no showy noisy kind of thing thirdly whilst we are looking at the nature of this another aspect comes to our mind salt to be effective or light to be effective it must be different from any other thing any other substance salt is salt light is light there should be no substitute for salt and there should be no substitute for light it can never be and so light is unique and salt is unique in itself and so it is my dear friends even with so many of us as believers called to serve the Lord we must remain unique effective but unique I'm not saying we should not be irreplaceable but of course in a sense we carry a message that is unique in itself the message of the salvation of the souls of men and so as salt and light we should be unique we should be different as I said there should not be fake salt nor fake light I've never heard about that anyway in my lifetime and I don't know if I will uh, because you see <laughs> we'll perhaps we'll talk about it another time the scientific composition of salt is uh, two elements sodium and what chlorine all right so sodium chloride comes to form a salt we'll talk about that next week Lord willing but my point is I'm making is this you can only have salt and you can only have light they will not be fake and that means therefore as believers there should not be counterfeits here there should not be anything to show 
that we are like others. We should be different in the way we do things and the way we accept things. There's a fourth thing which we, we are looking at the nature. It is what we call the influencing agent. Salt is an influencing agent. It either makes the 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 palava the, the palava sauce or whatever it is palatable or not. Okay, it is an influencing uh, agent. It causes something to happen, and it causes something to be sweet to the taste of that which people will know. The same thing with light. Light brings comfort. Those of us who have lived here in um, parts of uh, Ghana before, many years ago, we had what we call the Dumso. I don't know if some of you have heard about that. But uh, power was so rationed that you have uh, electricity for uh, some hours a day or even a whole day and the next two, three days you are in darkness. And so when uh, the lights are off, everybody, the place is all quiet. All the restaurants, every place, except those with generators, and every place is quiet. And you can hear a shout when the lights come on. You can hear almost like the children, everyone shouting, hey, you're so happy because the lights have come on. Light brings cheer. It brings comfort. It makes us see. So are our believers. You know, my dear friends, we are not saying that. Therefore, when believers go out anywhere, uh, there should be people who will be praising them. But of course, wherever we go as believers, our influence must be such that we bring joy and comfort in the hearts of many. You see it? Something about us should cause people to change their minds. Just as it was uh, uh, observed about the apostles. After Peter and John spoke, what did the Sanhedrin council say? It said, these have been with Jesus. They could see something of Christ in them. Some influencing agency in them. And so must we be. And that is what we know. Then of course, what it means is this. Salt and light are common attractions. What I mean by common attractions, it simply means this. There are things that are so common and yet they are loved and liked. You see it? You like salt and you like light when you see it there. So my dear friends, that makes it quite clear. But let me begin to uh, round up this evening's Bible study by looking at our third heading. The implications of the metaphor. And these implications, we may just take a few of them, uh, just about three of them, and we'll go through and uh, Lord willing, we'll continue next week. Let me read the text again. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. You know, my dear friends, this implies a number of things. And when we just want to uh, put it all together as we round up. Number one, salt and light are essential needs. You need it. You need it, friends. You need salt. If you don't have salt, your food becomes bland. That's what the English people will say. Tasteless. And if you do not have light, you are in darkness. Salt and light are essential needs. By the way, believers or Christians are essential needs. Let me put it that way. We are needed by the world. Now think about it. Think about the corruptions that is in the world now. Think about all the wickedness. Think about everything that has been done. Think about how businesses, companies, many of them just aim at profit. And they don't care about the lives of the people. 
Think about how you have businessmen and women, some of them aiming just simply to make profit. Look at all the corruption, not only here in Africa. Of course, there is corruption everywhere. Look at how things can be twisted. Look at how even news can be twisted. Many of the networks, President Donald Trump calls them fake news, which in many ways it is true because they twist the stories, pervert to change minds, because they have a certain agenda to follow. Look at all the wickedness that is being done under the sun. The killings, senseless killings, we may say. Look at the high rate of immorality in our world. Look at all the things that people have been done and are doing. Look at how the institution of marriage is being pulled down one by one. And look at how evil seems to be reigning. Look at how wicked people seem to have taken over, pursuing their own agenda and all the things that we see. And look at everything all around us. Oh, my dear friends, salt, light are essential commodities. And so are believers, friends. In this dark world, let me read you the text I read earlier. In Philipp Philippians chapter 2, and verse 15, not what Paul says here, maybe from verse 14, do all things without memories and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And then verse 16, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain so my dear friends don't sit in your homes I plead with you and say well the world can go berserk I thank God I'm saved and I'm happy I'm saved no you are the salt the world needs. You are the light the world needs. Think about many broken homes. Think about many broken marriages. Think about divorces. Even with children. Think about all those things that are happening. Think about the recklessness that is there. And how human life is being run down. Who will speak for the vulnerable? Who will speak for the weak? Who will speak for those who are voiceless? Who will speak for those who are deprived? Who will speak for those who are disorientated? Who can bring light and cheer to those who are hopeless and helpless? Those who are suffering all kinds of challenges, physical challenges, deformities, mental problems, depressions, stresses, whatever it be, who will bring them some cheer and bring them light? Oh, my dear friends, salt, light is needed. So, believer, Christian, believe you me, you are in great demand. You need to be around. Secondly, there's another implication here. Christians must not I must always be proactive in their influence. Throw away apathy. Throw it all away. Tell yourself, Jesus says, I am the light and I am the salt. How can I be effective? How can I affect my community? How can I influence many people to come to know the Lord? Well, I don't need to have a megaphone. Oh, I don't need to go and buy food, anything, have a, uh, things to go around. No. C.H. Spurgeon is on record as saying, any man who is saved does not need to be taught how to lead others to Christ. If you are saved, you just tell them how you are saved. You tell them your testimony. That is what you have. I was once a sinner. 
grace found me. I lived in sin, but now the Lord has changed my heart. That is the testimony you have. How did the Lord do it? I heard his message. I knew that I'm a sinner. And I knew I was going to hell. And the Lord, I prayed to him. And asked for grace and pardon. And he forgave my sin. So you see, you don't need any training even for this. Apathy, friends, among Christians is becoming unbecoming. People are in our churches who don't seem to care for spiritual things. They don't care if their next door neighbor is living in sin and will go to hell. It doesn't bother them in a way to tell them about Christ. Even their own children, it doesn't bother them to tell them to come to know Christ. What an amazing... It's apathy, friends. Salt and light. Salt is not apathetic. Neither is light. But my dear friends, the third and final implication that I want to bring to your understanding is this. Christians must never stop influencing the world. In other words, now, if you read from verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Persecution will come. Verse 12, 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. These things will happen. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted the prophets which, are, which were before you. Ye are the sort of the earth. You know what Jesus is saying? Even when there's persecution, don't cease being a sort. Don't stop. Don't stop showing the lights. In other words, let the persecution come. Let the difficulties come. Let the challenges come. Let the mockery come. Let the rejection come. But never ever cease to be salt of the earth or light of the world. In other words, the salt must continue seasoning. And the light must continue shining. No matter what happens, friend. The light must shine. The salt must work. And so, my dear friends, with these words, I hope perhaps I've uh, uh, provoked you to begin to look into scripture. Ask yourself, am I being salt? Am I really a light? Well, I cannot be salt or light till Christ is in my heart. Till I know him. Until I have any kind of uh, fellowship with him, I can never do his will. So perhaps you have never addressed this question to yourself before. But ask yourself, are you a believer? Are you a believer in the Lord? If you are a believer, if you have come to trust, then I plead with you. Be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And no matter what it be, that, my dear friends, is our calling. And may God help us, even in these things, for his own name's sake. Amen. Let's close our service by singing the hymn numbered 446. Sorry, the hymn numbered 444. Hymn 444 in the Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship. Jesus, then all victorious love shared in my soul abroad. Then shall my feet no longer rove, rooted and fixed in God. <laughs>
bless it indeed grant us grace that indeed we may know more and more and desire more and more and we pray that Lord I will be with each one of us the rest of the week that O oh Lord thy grace will be with us and that we can meet again on the Lord's day O oh Lord help us and bless us and be thou with us as we ask all of these things for Christ and his glory and for his sake and now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior the love of God our Heavenly Father the fellowship and communion of the Holy Ghost our Comforter rest and continue with each one of us now and forevermore Amen We thank you all for being with us and uh, studying together with us and for watching therefore we ask that I will continue to be with us again coming Lord's Day at 10 a.m. local Ghana time for our uh, Sunday morning gospel service and dear friends you can always contact us on our page also and uh, we will get back to you may God bless you for his own name's sake Amen